Uh oh. <laughs> Ready? Okay, here we go. Now we're going to get into uh, one of my favorite parts of, of the Bible, the tabernacle. Uh, you know, you kind of have a tendency when you're on your favorite part to spend too much time on it, so I'll try not to do that. <coughs> Uh, we're going when Moses goes up onto the mountain here in chapters 25 to 31. We had the first tabernacle section. There are two sections on the tabernacle. We're just going to go through one of them. But the tabernacle blueprints were given to uh, Moses by God, and these are the precise plans for a building, a temporary building, to be moved for the worship of God. In Exodus 25, 1 through 9. God commanded that specific materials be used in this dwelling. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. The plans for the tabernacle were direct special revelation from God. God spoke to Moses. The whole book of Leviticus, with a few exceptions, is like this. It is a uh, direct special revelation from God. And while everyone was invited to give for the tabernacle, only those who with the motivation to glorify God were to give. And this is give with a cheerful heart, right out of 2 Corinthians 9, 7, not under compulsion. In Exodus 25, 3-7, these expensive building materials came from the riches they took from Egypt. If you remember back in Exodus 12, they were given the spoils of Egypt. And so all the gold, the silver, the bronze, the different fabrics... All these things came from, not all of them, there's a couple of things that they would get along the, the sea there, but most of the, the hard metals and materials came from their spoils of Egypt. Next is 25.8a, God the Holy Spirit devoted 50 chapters of the Bible to this divine dwelling place. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. This is the purpose of this thing, is for God to dwell the purpose of the structure was to provide a place for the Shekinah glory of Holy God to dwell with His people. Shekinah glory uh, it comes from the word for uh, Mishkan, for a tabernacle, and it's a term that's not in the Bible, Shekinah glory, but it is a term that describes the glory of God, just sort of like Trinity, not found in the Bible, but describes the existence of God. Exodus 25.9, Moses had to follow God's plan exactly because the divine design created a shadow, a type, or a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. And we'll go to Hebrews 9 and look at something in a little bit uh, dealing with that. Now just sit back for a moment and let's take a tour of the tabernacle. And then we'll look at the details of it. Here's the altar of sacrifice in a visual here. And I thought we had it loaded. But it may take it just a little bit to load up so that it'll play. I was going to tell you this, that it, this needs to be done if you don't want to take it too much time because it's such a big file. But, did it, um, but this is the altar of sacrifice. You see the four uh, horns of the sacrifice, these four pointing different directions. This thing was made of bronze. Uh, it was made of wood overlaid with bronze and had two poles that they would use to carry it. Those poles would be removed once they got it to a place so that they could... Um, uh, work around it. The priests are going to be working around uh, this, this thing as they work with the different uh, sacrifices. Now that grating in there is differences of opinion exactly where that grating is supposed to fit, but uh, some will have it at the very top, some in the middle, some in the bottom. So it's uh, hard to say for sure. Now there are different ways of looking at the labor. The labor is one of the least described pieces of the tabernacle. Its main emphasis is on its function. And its the function was to cleanse the hands and the feet of the priest who was operating. And so some of these labors will have a place for the feet, some will not. They, there's all kinds of different ways in which they try to portray that. But one of the other main things is it was made of the mirrors of the ladies. The ladies gave their mirrors, and when the, when the priest would come in to wash his hands, he'd be able to see his reflection in the mirror. And it's the idea, when you go to the Word of God, and you see yourself in the mirror of the Word of God, that, that, that kind of has a, uh, maybe a type relationship there, at least analogy to that. 
And then once you came past the labor, you would enter into the tabernacle proper. But only the priests would go into there. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. You're right here at the altar of sacrifice. You're there with your lamb, cutting the throat of your lamb. With your, you've identified with it. You've cut the throat of this lamb to kill it. And while you're doing that, right there is the entrance into the holy place and then the most holy place. On the other side of that curtain is the presence of God. Imagine that as everyday Israelite bringing in his sacrifice, but he never got to go in there. Only the priest got to go in there. But now as a believer in Christ, you're a priest. And you have access to God's presence anytime as a believer in Christ. So you go into the tabernacle proper. The first place is called the holy place. And so you walk in here, and when you get inside, and this is where the real beauty starts to come out of the tabernacle. We come inside, the first thing that would catch your uh, eye is the lampstand. Table of showbread over here. And we're going to show that in the tabernacle, at least, the altar of incense was not in this section. Uh, Hebrews point makes this very clear, but you'll never find any model like that, but I'll tell you why here in a little bit. But you have these pieces, uh, you have the curtain, the veil to take you back into the most holy place or the holy of holies, these pillars, and the closer you get to God here, the, the greater the value of the metal and everything else gets more uh, splendor. In the inside, these angels were... Um, embroidered in on the fabric so it's like being in the presence of God is the angels serving in God's presence that's what you would see when you came in so let's look at the pieces here's the table of showbread and you'll see different models of this as well because of the crown molding it's hard to say exactly what it looked like but this is very close I think it may have been a smooth rim instead of the overhang but they would always have the bread on the table of showbread the poles to carry this was made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold and it was put together uh, and was able to be carried by the poles, which were removed when they were placed into uh, position. And the most ornate piece is the lampstand. It was made of, out of one solid piece of gold. And it's not a candlestick, it's a lampstand. Candles didn't come along to a lot longer. You had these lamps that gave the only light in the, in the holy place, as you had these oil lamps. We'll talk a little more detail about it here in a minute. And then the altar of incense where the, they would burn the incense of the prayers, the fragrance. When I say the prayers, that's what it represented as they were before God, the fragrant aroma of the incense. And for some reason, her animation has decided to stop. Did this right here a while ago. Do I? Well, let me go back, and if I, so, then I won't repeat myself uh, later on with the lampstand. Uh, when the lamps, they would trim the lamps one at a time so they were not all snuffed out. They would come in and snuff it, and they would take a lamp and replenish, uh, replenish the oil, trim the wick, and place it back, and they'd go and do every one of those. They'd do this twice a day. They would replace the bread uh, once a week. They would burn incense twice a day, and this was all in coordination with the two sacrifices that happened in the morning and the evening out on the altar of sacrifice of the lambs that were sacrificed every day. So everyone was doing all these different services uh, within the tabernacle. This altar of incense is made the same way as the table of showbread with acacia wood overlaid with gold and has the poles again for them to be carried. Uh, some will have... Instead of four rings, it'll have two rings that pivot because they were to keep the incense on it. And if you carry this up a hill, you can see where it might lean. But if it's on a pivot on a swivel, then it would always stay level as you carried it. Uh, that's, we can't verify that, but that's just one thing that, uh, did it move? It didn't move? <laughs> okay, it also has the four horns going out in four different directions, uh, just like the altar of sacrifice. All right, now, maybe we can get the... Now, we're inside the tabernacle proper. Here's, the, uh, again, the lampstand on the left. This table of showbread on the right. Here's the altar of incense. And hopefully in a moment, we'll fly over the altar of incense into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is, where the presence of God was located. God dwelt above the cherubim. The Ark of the Covenant was 
also made of acacia wood overlaid with gold except for the mercy seat. The mercy seat was made of one solid piece of gold with the cherubim pounded out into it and it covered the ark. The ark was basically a box, really, a chest, and it's going to be used to hold uh, some things uh, in it, as we'll see later on. And those poles were never removed. Those poles were kept in position, and when they were put in there, he was kept in position because it showed that God could be ready to get up and move them at any moment. And also, as you move the poles in and out over time, wear and tear would happen. And this represented God. It wasn't God, although we'll see they, some begin to think it was, but it represented God. And so you didn't want to do anything that would take away from the representation of God. Now if I can get it to do it, we'll let it fly over one time. What kind of oil they burn in the lamp? Absolute pure olive oil. The very first that you get. In other words, what we get is uh, olive oil, virgin olive oil, is after they've squeezed them a little bit. These were you get and you, you just kind of bump them and, and they get bruised and it would be pure white and it would burn a pure white light with no residue. And so it was very expensive. And one of the interesting things about that, all the spices that they use in the altar of incense and some of the other things, they, you couldn't get those spices in the land of Israel. It forced them to have to trade with the caravan routes. And that forces them to come in contact with the world, which is what they were supposed to do, and tell them about Yahweh. So it's an interesting thing on the way that, the way that works out. Ah, here we go. And so here's the Ark of the Covenant. Again, this is where God was supposed to dwell. Okay. <laughs> now then we'll come to the other slide. All right, here we go. All right, in Exodus 25, 10 through 22, we had the Ark of the Covenant, which was the centerpiece of the tabernacle. It's the centerpiece of the tabernacle. And we're not going to read through much of this as far as in the text. We're just uh, going to talk about it as we go. Exodus 25, 10a, Acacia wood is harder and heavier than oak, not easily damaged by insects, making it an excellent material. It was not totally incorruptible, but it uh, was a good wood to have that would avoid corruption for a long period of time. Exodus 25, 10b, with a cubit equaling 46 centimeters or 18 inches, the ark was 1.14 meters long, 68.5 centimeters wide, and 68.5 centimeters high. And we have that in metric in English systems because we're the only guys that use English. Every the rest of the world use metric system. We're always slow in stuff like that. We're never slow in heresy, but we're always slow in those things. Exodus 25, 11 through 15, this small box, and that's basically what it was. I mean, this is not much taller than this. A small box. Same thing with the uh, table of showbread and the altar of incense. And I have a theory on that. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute if I forget, tell me. But it's a small box. Why is it so small? Why is it like this? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this small box was to be overlaid with gold inside and out, fitted with gold molding to carry it. Two poles made of the same materials were inserted into four rings fastened at the bottom of the box. In Exodus 25, 16, the ark served as a container for specific items. Hebrews 9, 4 tells us that three objects were eventually placed in the ark. The manna, uh, omer of manna, uh, we, read, we saw that in Exodus 16. Uh, it wasn't at that moment that it was placed in there, but eventually the manna, which was a sufficient, satisfying, sustaining food provision, was put in there. Later on, Aaron's rod that budded, symbolizing that Aaron and his descendants were God's chosen priesthood. It was put in there, and it's really a symbol of, of Israel's rebellion because they were rejecting Aaron's priesthood. And then the tablets of the law that, uh, uh, were put in there, symbolizing the moral law, which no one can obey perfectly. So these things were put into the chest. Exodus 25, 17 through 21, the mercy seat, which was the top of the chest supported two golden cherubim, intelligent, powerful, winged, angelic creatures often associated with God's throne room. It was these cherubim 
type uh, creatures that were put at the entrance into the Garden of Eden to keep man out. Uh, whenever we see the cherubim, they're always associated with the righteous standard of God somehow. In Exodus 25, 22, after the tabernacle was finished, exactly as God instructed, Moses talked to him in the Holy of Holies, the location of the ark. And that's worth reading right there. He says, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Now, when we walk through the tabernacle, where did we begin? On the outside, the altar sacrifice. When God reveals the tabernacle, where did He begin? All the way inside. Keep that in mind. He works inside, goes out, then will come back inside and go back out again. This is the formula in which He reveals it. Not the way we do. Now, when we come to God, we have to come starting on the outside. But when God reveals it, He does it in a pattern. And that pattern is going to be important to watch. The significance of the ark. I think we have some typology here, but we definitely have some uh, illustrations. The ark symbolized the presence of eternal God with His people. This is no doubt about that. He was with His people. The Shekinah glory was there. They could see it. He had the, the pillar of cloud there. The presence of God in the tabernacle. The ark's cost the materials. Pictures God's purity. Only the best was used for the tabernacle. Interestingly, God designed the ark of His presence of two materials. One prone to decay, wood, and one with endurance, gold. Christ, who was God, present among men, was both a frail human and eternal God. He was the God-man. And this is an interesting thing when you talk about the, the person of Christ. He has two natures, but He's one person. The ark was made of two elements, but one ark. The table of showbread made of two different materials, one table. Jesus Christ, as the God-man, has two different natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature, but He's one person. And you run the, run the theology through these little tangible things, and it, it helps. This gives you a little perspective, maybe. Yes, there it is, of the ark of the covenant. See, look how small it is. It comes to that guy's mid-thigh. Two feet, three inches. Why so small? Same thing with the table of showbread. Well, you see what I'm doing? Let's get hard on, the back, hard on my back right now. Just doing this. But imagine having to do all the work in this way. I think it drove them to their knees before the Lord as they served. That's a, that's a deduction. I'm going to make that clear. But uh, that's why I think it's done this way. It's a humble position that they're brought to as they serve. It doesn't have to be like that. And, you know, the Jewish people are usually a little shorter than than Gentile people, but still could be. In Exodus 25, 23 through 30, you have the table of showbread. Exodus 25, 23a, because this description came immediately after God's announcement of meeting and speaking, the table of showbread probably refers to fellowship. I don't want to be too dogmatic about that, but uh, the bread, fellowship, is something you see in Scripture that's the table of the presence, or the bread of the presence and the presence of God. The table measuring 36 by 18 was smaller than the ark, which measured 45 by 27. So it's a little bit smaller than the ark itself. Like the ark, the table had a gold molding and four rings for carrying it with poles. Exodus 25, 29, the serving vessels used by the priests in the worship rituals, were made of pure gold. And then the unleavened bread was kept continually before the Lord. And some say what they would do, I'll tell you what, let me wait until I show the picture and I'll explain that. Because you'll be able to understand what I'm saying a little better. The significance of the table of showbread, overall it pictured continual fellowship with God, who had established a contract with them. It pictured continual fellowship with God. The twelve loaves connected the twelve tribes of Israel to the covenant. The twelve loaves, twelve tribes of Israel. The table which held the bread was made of two materials, wood and gold. 
Jesus Christ, the provider of the bread of life, had two natures, human and divine, theologically called the hypostatic union. Typologically, the table, like the ark, emphasized the combined humanity and deity of Jesus, and the bread pictured him as the bread of life. That's at least an illustration, if not a type. Now, there's a heavenly tabernacle that just fell. What was that? There's a heavenly tabernacle. And what Moses gets to see is the heavenly tabernacle. And there are some things God's going to say, you have them build it according to what you saw. And so what we're seeing in the tabernacle itself is a, is a microcosm of something in heaven. And, so I, I, there's, and because there's 50 chapters of the Bible dedicated to it, I think there's more to it than just these, you know, this nice little tent. There's some things we're supposed to kind of dig into. I think we can make some deductions here. Don't be too dogmatic about some of them, but we can make some deductions because I think we're supposed to. I think it was designed by God to teach things to Israel. Some things we might not even understand what they learned from it. But it was a visual to teach Israel some things. Some things I think we can be very sure of. This particular table of showbread, you see the lips a little bit different than the other one. And this is on the theory that when the priest would come in to change out the bread, one priest would have the bread and the other one would be taking the other off. And as he was taking that one off, he'd be sliding the other one so that there was always fresh bread or bread on the table. Of course, the other way of thinking of it is you just take one off, put one on, take one off, put the other on. So, you know, it's just, we don't know exactly how they were going about the ritual with it, but it was unleavened bread. And one of the main times it comes into play in Scripture is David when he's, uh, trying to flee from, from Saul, and he needs food for his men. Next is 25, 31 through 40. The golden lampstand provided light for the holy place. The golden lampstand provided light for the holy place. It's made of pure gold. It's the most ornate furnishing in the tabernacle. And the Temple Institute has a new one made, ready to go into the temple as soon as they can get rid of that rock on the Temple Mount. In Exodus 25, 32b through 36, the lampstand resembled an olive tree, but had almond blossoms on it. This comes into play when we get into Zechariah because he has a dream or vision of the olive branch tree, two of them actually, and uh, this is going to be important when we get there with those lampstands. 25, 37 to 39, the lamp snuffers. You snuff out the lamp, and trays were made of pure gold. Most everything inside the tabernacle proper is made of gold. Once again, God commanded Moses to copy the exact pattern he showed him. 25, verse 40. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. This is said several times. And again, you get some different renditions of what the lampstand looked like, the table of showbread looked like, the labor looked like, but Moses knew what it was supposed to look like. And so when those guys build it, he says, no, you need to do this, this, or this. And they finally finish it, and they say, is this what it looks like? That's it. He would know. He would verify what it was supposed to be like. And so he's the one, and that's again part of his leadership and verifying who Moses is because God would not come and dwell there if it wasn't perfect. And when God comes to dwell, that means they did it right. In Exodus 27, 20 through 21, the priest's responsibility to care for the lamp and the people's responsibility to provide the oil were constant rules for Israel to obey. It was the people's responsibility to get the oil for the lampstand. It was the priest's responsibility to take care of it and trim the lamps and fill the lamps. The meaning of the lampstand. The continual burning of the lamps reflected God's watchful presence over Israel. And that one I think we very, can be very sure of. The primary feature of the lampstand was light. The light shone in the darkness so the priests could see to perform their priestly duties. They had to be able to see how to, where the table of showbread was. Typologically, the lampstand pictured Jesus shining as the light of the world. He brings spiritual light to the spiritual darkness of this world and gives light the ability to see the truth. 
Some might say, and again, these are deductions that are made as far as trying to understand exactly everything that goes on in this, but with the lampstand here and the table of showbread here, some will say that uh, the, the light, the Holy Spirit shedding light in, uh, inside on the Word of God, the bread of the, the bread of the Word. Some will draw those conclusions. So you just don't want to be too dogmatic about these things, but there's, there's something to this. And I think there's a lot more work to be done in the right way. Well, I don't want to see types all over the place. We need to spend a little more time in the tabernacle. So here's a cutout of the whole thing. You see Israel's camped all the way around it. And that's the thing. That God also sets up how they camp around it. The tabernacle was the center of life of Israel. Later on it would be the temple. What do you do at the tabernacle? You worship. Worship of God is supposed to be the center, the priority of our life. And this is definitely demonstrated with the tabernacle. But here's the lampstand inside the tabernacle opposite of the table of showbread. And there's a priest picture uh, drawing of trimming the lamps and everything inside the tabernacle. Okay, I need to switch out PowerPoints. And with that one down, hopefully we won't have <laughs> that problem with that other one again. I think my computer's saying I'm over. Needs a shot of adrenaline. Here it comes. Okay. There's that real elder board, not the other. This guy here on the left or the right, Tim, he's he'll be going with me to uh, Africa in October. Okay, now continuing with the tabernacle. Next is. Uh, 26, 1 through 30, the walls of the tabernacle, which were made of interlocking wood planks, surrounded two rooms and had a three layer fabric roof spread tightly over the top. Now, again, the planks are different ways of looking at this. Most, most models are going to have the planks this way, side by side, around, making a solid wall of gold. I'm okay with that, but stability is a problem. It makes more sense, really, for it to be studded this way especially with the weight of these fabrics. Uh, of course, there is ways of reinforcing that which come out, but regardless of how you do it, this is what these things were made out of, and they were separated into two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. Exodus 26, 1 through 6, the inner curtains measuring 42 inches long, 6 inches wide, were made of skillfully woven cloth in three colors. The scarlet and the uh, white and the purple, or indigo type color. And this was the fine Egyptian linen. Uh, Egypt's still kind of known for that. Exodus 26, it wasn't where you were uh, one, in one area. The slightly larger protective curtains were made of goat hair, ram skins, and porpoise skins. The slightly larger protective curtains. Uh, they, they would, the porpoise skins, these would be those that could be found around the uh, either the Red Sea or maybe even the uh, Mediterranean but probably the Red Sea and the uh, goat hair and the ram skins they had plenty of. The wall boards which measured 15 feet they were 15 feet tall and 2 feet 3 inches wide stabilized the tabernacle. Bars gave more support and stability to the framework of the building, 25 to 29. And God not only gave Moses a verbal description of the tabernacle, but let him foresee its completed appearance. And Hebrews 8, 5 describes uh, some of that. 
Well, we're going to save the Hebrews passage for here in a minute. But Hebrews does have a description of the tabernacle. Next is 26, 31 through 37, the veil and the arrangement of the furniture. The veil, which was made of one piece of cloth, separated the holy place from the most holy place. Most holy place being where the Ark of the Covenant was located. The Ark was inside the most holy place, a small inner room separated from the holy place by the veil. Again, that was, that was the presence of, uh, of God there. The table of showbread was on the north side of the holy place and the lampstand on the south side. Now, this is going to be important because that means that the Ark of the Covenant is at the west. That makes the entrance at the east. That will be important in a little bit. Next is 2636, the outside screen or curtain door, which was the work of a skilled weaver, was different from the inside curtain. God, they had, there's different guys gifted, talented to do the work, and they're going to uh, do the work for the tabernacle. The posts for the outside screen were set in sockets of bronze, while the inside curtains called the veil, they were set in silver sockets. As you move away from God, in the tabernacle, the metals lessen in value. As you move to them, they get greater in value. And there's uh, something to that. Exactly what? It's hard to make that for sure, but something's going on there. As the farther you get away from God, the lesser life is, maybe. The significance of the structure of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a copy of the heavenly structure seen by Moses, making it a piece of heaven on earth. That's what makes the tabernacle so interesting and special is is that is you're getting a snapshot of what something is in heaven. It's a piece of heaven on earth. The tabernacle had images of the real cherubim who serve as God's attendants in His throne room. Whenever we see a throne room uh, vision, we have angels operating there, cherubim and seraphim. So these angels are embroidered into the fabric. God designed the entire structure to show His absolute holy character, which demands respect, because there's separation. You've got a separation between the most holy place and the holy place, and the holy place, which is separated from everything else in the compound, and then you've got a, a door that separates everything from the outside with a gate around it. It's separation, separation, separation. And in order to come to God, you're going to have to come through the right way. You can't get to Him any way you want to. You couldn't dig a tunnel under. You couldn't jump over. You come one way and you had to keep coming toward Him. Typologically, the work of Christ removed the veil so that anyone can come into the presence of the Father through Him. Remember, the veil was split in two from top to bottom, Matthew points that out, in the temple. So here's, again, inside the tabernacle. You can see with this Construction. Let me let me blow that up if I can. With this construction, it has those solid gold walls there, which would uh, it has its splendor too. But uh, others will have it studded, and then you would have you would see more of the curtain there. But you have uh, the whole setup inside the tabernacle. There's a table of showbread with the uh, utensils on it. This one has the altar of incense to the side. You'll see some like that. Uh, but here are the uh, veil curtains up here at the top. There's the curtain that is um, uh, what you would see is the ceiling. And then you have the red covering and then the uh, outside covering. Exodus 27, 1 through 8, the Israelites were most familiar with the altar of sacrifice. So that's the one everyday Israelites could come in contact with. So the altar of sacrifice is what they saw the most of. Exodus 27.1, the altar's dimensions given in cubits formed a square box, seven feet six inches long on each side, four feet six inches tall. And it's not very big when you think about it. Exodus 27.2 is made of bronze. It would withstand the heat of the fires of the sacrifices. If you made that thing of gold, it'd melt. But the bronze is going to be able to withstand the heat. Again, bronze is a picture of judgment in Scripture, and that's what this altar is all about. 
The altar's utensils and grating were also made of bronze so that it could take the heat. The altar of sacrifice had to be portable like the other pieces of the tabernacle, therefore it was hollow. This makes it lighter. But I think also makes it possible to maintain the command of how to build an altar out of stones and earth. They would be able to fill that hollow section with uh, stones and earth when they got it to wherever they needed to have it. And that would also help in the heat distribution so that it didn't get to be too hot, especially on the outside of it. Did not have to do it that way, but uh, it's possible. But it definitely was hollow. The significance of the altar of sacrifice. Leviticus 11, 44 through 45, God is holy and those whom God identifies himself must be holy. He says, I am holy, therefore you be holy. Typologically, the sacrifices on the altar foreshadowed the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. It points to the person of Christ. And here's some drawings, priests before they are. I think it's probably a little tall, or he's a little short. But uh, you see different renditions of it, just like you do everything else. These are uh, different replicas of the utensils that were used uh, for the altar of sacrifice. Exodus 27, 9 through 19, the courtyard fence served as another boundary separating those on the outside from God's holiness on the inside. It's a separation boundary. A fence of woven linen hangings enclosed the outer court. Again, these would be the Egyptian linen. The dimensions of the courtyard allowed 11,250 square feet for the operation of the tabernacle. It's big, but it's not as big as you think it probably ought to be to accommodate so many people. There'd be a lot of people that would be bringing sacrifices once we get into Leviticus. The only entrance into the tabernacle was on the eastern side, meaning those entering walked away from the east toward the west. Isn't it interesting? What we had in Genesis, every time they went away from God, they went east. What do they have to do? Decide, I'm not going east anymore. I'm not trusting in the direction I'm headed. And then want to come to God. And to come to God, he had to go back west. He had to come back to where he was. And there was only one way to do it. Through the entrance, through the altar, with the priest mediating on your behalf. That's what they would have to do in order to come back. The gate, which was 30 feet wide, was made of the same fabric as the inner curtain of the tabernacle. And this kind of connects the two, the entrance to the inside. Ropes secured by a hook on each post stabilized the courtyard fence. And wind blowing and other things, and also animals wandering around that need to have stability. The significance of the courtyard fence the tabernacle structure allowed God to dwell in the midst of His people, Israel, without corrupting His holiness because a barrier separated holy God from sinful man. He was able to dwell among them and not consume them. Although some get consumed a few times, as we'll find out. Typologically, the one entrance into the tabernacle reflected the absolute truth that entrance into God's presence is gained only through Jesus Christ, the one door. And then you have these large sections on the priesthood. Before we get that, let's look at the gate here. There's a guy bringing his bull in through the one door. Here's replicas of the posts and the ropes tied down. It's what the fence would have looked like here the pegs and the ropes to tie it down with. And in this section, the priesthood is described with the garments, especially of the high priest, who had performed the services in the tabernacle. In verses 1 through 5, Moses described the clothing for Aaron and his sons briefly. And then he's going to uh, unpack them, just like we, what we saw in Genesis 1 and 2. You get the big picture and then zero in on important parts, Moses is going to do the same thing here. The ephod, 
uh, as a type of apron worn on the priest's chest was made of the same material as the curtains in the tabernacle. Made of the same materials as the curtains in the tabernacle. And I'll show you the, some pictures of these things in just a second. Verses 15 through 30, the breast piece. Note the economy of Scripture there. Proportionality, all the verses describing the breast piece. It was ornamental and connected to the ephod. It's one of the most important pieces. It has all the tribes of Israel on it, the different colors, uh, all those different things. The stones that are used there are, uh, most all of them are mentioned in Ezekiel for the stones that uh, uh, Lucifer is described with. Exodus 28, 31 through 35, the blue robe enhanced the ephod without drawing attention from it. The well, it's supposed to be focused on is the breastplate. You don't want walk in, people walking up and going, oh, what a wonderful robe when they're supposed to focus on the breastplate. 36 through 38, the unique headgear emphasized the exclusivity of the office of the high priest. Not everyone could be high priest. You had to be of certain lineage. We have a great high priest. Not anyone now can be our great high priest. It's got to be Jesus Christ. But in Christ, we're all priests. It's no longer this specific priesthood in, in the way you have in the uh, law with the Levitical priesthood, now you're a priest if you're in Christ. And you're your own mediator. You take yourself to God. You go into His presence in prayer. Exodus 28, 39, the tunic was a shirt worn under other clothing. 28, 40 through 43, the uniform of the attending priest was simple compared to the clothing of uh, the high priest is basically just a white robe. What's the significance of the priest's clothing? The special clothing of the priest reflected their special service in a special place called the tabernacle. Special service in a special place. Typologically, the high priest as a mediator between God and man foreshadowed the great high priest Jesus Christ. We have such a great high priest who can sympathize with us because he's been tested in every way which we are, yet without sin. Therefore, we can come before the throne of grace with boldness to find help in the time of need because why we have such a great high priest. Here's what the priest's clothing looked like. Uh, this is the ephod here, kind of like an apron. Uh, uh, worn and there's different ways some will have this thing covering everything up here as well so you have different renditions of this then you have the uh, where it's connected with the onyx stones here you had the different tribes of Israel on each of these stones on the shoulders he's bearing the the representing and bearing the the uh, uh, not, he's not really bearing the sin but he's bearing Israel before God is the idea and here's the breastplate and again, you have all the tribes of Israel mentioned one on each of the stones of the breastplate. And here's the Umim and the Thumim. And we don't know exactly how these things work, but they were kept in the pocket of the breastplate here. The breastplate is made of cloth and has these things uh, put on them. But one thing we do know, we don't see the Umim and the Thumim being used after David's time. It's always a prophet then. It's used very sparingly. We don't know exactly how they used it, but it was the one way in which they did use it as far as what the purpose was, was to figure out what God's will was. But we, there's very little information in Scripture on it other than its existence for the most part. So it's an interesting thing. Some, I mean, there's all kinds of theories. Some say that take it in, the, you know, in different parts of the breastplate, the stones would glow and show you which, <laughs> which letter it was or... Different things like that. We don't know. We don't know how it works. God could work it that way, but we don't, we don't know. Now, here's an interesting thing. The fringe of the robe. You note the blue robe. The fringe of the robe. You have a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. All the way around the fringe. When the high priest was operating, wherever he was, you could hear him with these bells. Now, if you put a bell against a bell, what do you get? A clanking noise. You don't get a pure, uh, pure sound. But against the pomegranate, each bell had its own individual tone. And it would be a nice, nice sound. And that might be an interesting thing to think about when you're teaching through 1 Corinthians and when Paul says you're just a clinking cymbal making a bunch of noise. 
So there's, this would have made just a bunch of noise. And that's not what it was to be. You were to hear the priest representing you before God as he was working. That was the idea. So that's an interesting little uh, aspect of the fringe of the, of the robe. Next is 29, 1 through 46. Aaron and his sons were inducted. So it was like an ordination into the priesthood of Israel. This was the official uh, induction. Verse 1a, the responsibility of the priest was to serve Yahweh in obedience. This is what they were supposed to do. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Ministers to God. All the ceremony and details better qualify these men for God's service. It's setting them apart for God's service. Laying their hands on the substitute sacrifice identified them with it. And this is what we're going to find in the Levitical uh, sacrifices. You'd put your hand on the head of that lamb, identifying with that animal that's about to die for you. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Burning the whole animal pictured its sufficiency and complete satisfaction as an atoning sacrifice, verses 15 through 18. Very similar to Passover, the whole thing was to be consumed. 20, uh, 19 through 30, the initial wave offering went to Moses as a one-time gift. Later, the wave offering went to the priest who performed the sacrifice. And what happens is Moses is going to serve as the leader when it, this actually takes place. This is just the instructions to do it. When it actually is done, when the tabernacle is first set up, Moses will do it all. I mean, he's, you know, he's 90 years old, 89 years old. I mean, he is stout, ready to go, moving all these pieces, setting the place, running up and down the mountain three times, you know, and all that. Very uh, in good shape here. But after that, it'll be the priest that'll do it. The ritual of the eating the flesh emphasized identification. The person believed that the sacrifice represented him. And that's a, uh, that takes, moves on into communion. When we partake of communion, we're identifying uh, with who Christ is in, in the ritual by eating the bread and drinking the cup. This is why the Lord uses that as an analogy in the, uh, after feeding the 5,000. The entire ceremony continued for one week. One week ordination service, we might say. <clears throat> Sacrificing a one-year-old male lamb in the morning and one in the evening totaled 720 lambs sacrificed each year. That's just for the maintenance of the tabernacle. That's not on top of all that each individual would bring throughout the year. 720 lambs each year. The significance of the ceremony, Old Testament priests had to be identified with a blood sacrifice to be acceptable to God. They're identified with a blood sacrifice. The sacrifice of the great mediator Jesus Christ provided the positional cleansing that makes us acceptable to God. Positional cleansing that makes us acceptable to God. Titus 3, 5-7. Washing of regeneration. All right, Exodus 31 through 10, the altar of incense. Now we've described the priests. Remember, we started with the Ark of the Covenant. Then we had the table of showbread, the lampstand, and then we jumped all the way outside after describing the veil and, and things to the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard. And now he describes the priests. Now we jump all the way back inside to describe the duties of the priests and the furniture that relates to it. And the first one is the altar of incense. The altar of incense was connected to the priests. The altar of incense was made in the same way as the other articles in the tabernacle except the solid gold lampstand. It's made of wood overlaid with gold. Next is 32-5. The altar of incense was much smaller than the altar of sacrifice. 36 inches high, 18 inches square. So it's smaller. The altar was in front of the veil. Now let's read that verse. In Exodus 30, verse 6, as God's telling him where to put it. Now remember how he started the first time. He started 
with the Ark of the Covenant, where his presence is, and worked out. And he's starting with the altar of incense. And he says, You shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the Ark of the Testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the Ark of the Testimony, where I will meet with you. Now, what's in front of the veil? Well, we might think that's... In other words, if I'm standing here as the Ark of the Covenant, and the table is the veil, where did I put it in front of the veil? It'd be on this side. If I was to put it behind the veil, it'd be on the other side. We're looking at it from God's perspective, not from coming in, but from going out. So my contention is the altar of incense is on the inside in the Holy of Holies. And I'm not alone. I got a very famous author. Let's go to Hebrews. That seconds it. Whoever he is. <laughs> we don't know who he is. But in Hebrews 9, we'll start with verse 1, because we've been alluding to some of these already, so let's go ahead and read all of them here. Hebrews 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. And remember that the writer of the Hebrews is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. He's showing why the new covenant is better, why the Melchizedekian priesthood is better, all these different things. Uh, the, that the priesthood of Christ is better than the Levitical priesthood. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded in the tablets of the covenant. Now if I read that right, in the Holy of Holies, the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant were in there. Well, so well, why in the world does every model have it in the holy place instead of the most holy place? Because that's where it was in the Herodian temple. Josephus tells us that. And where Zacharias burned incense in Luke 1, it was in the holy place, not the most holy place. What we know, there was nothing there. It didn't have the ark there. No presence of God there. Other than when Jesus himself was there. And from that, we take that and then just interpret what we've read in Exodus under that understanding. But the writer of Hebrews makes it very clear. Now, there may be some argument on, in the Temple of Solomon that it wasn't that way. But in the tabernacle, I don't see how you can get around that. Because he makes it very clear what is there. And then if you think of it that way, and you go back and look at the pattern which God showed it, starting with the ark, going out with the table, the lampstand, and then outside in the courtyard to the, ark of, uh, the altar of sacrifice, and then comes back again inside the same place, altar of incense, and then goes out to the courtyard again, to the labor, it fits the pattern, you see. And if I'm starting at the Ark of the Covenant, and God says, put it in front of the veil, then it's going to be here, inside the same place as the Ark of the Covenant. In verse 5, he says, And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak in detail. And I'm like, why? <laughs> Tell us some more. You know, I'd like to know more. But he doesn't tell us more than that. Now, I'm not saying you have to go rewrite all your books. Just put a footnote. Because you just put a footnote and put Hebrews 9 there. Exodus 30, 7 through 10. Aaron the high priest burned the incense every morning and evening when he trimmed the lamps. And later on, some of these duties will be uh, regulated to other priests. Of course, uh, there will be different high priests later on. Comparing these verses with Exodus 29, 38-42 shows that the burning of incense coincided with the morning and evening sacrifices. For the sake of time, we're not going to do that, but we'll give you the verses there so you can go and do that. These sacrifices and the trimming and burning of incense occurred about every 12 hours. Twice a day, every 12 hours, really from sun up, sun down, when these things would happen. Exodus 30, 34 through 38. A priest ground the incense ingredients together into a powder and set it apart unto the Lord. He used a mortar and a pestle to do it. 
And you get a lot of strange things that sound nice, but again, be careful. They'll say that uh, when you're grounding uh, the mortar, it makes some sort of sound. It sounds like uh, the bones of Christ pulling apart on the cross, you know, stuff like that. Don't, don't, you know, be careful about those types of things. Uh, it, sometimes it sounds good, but uh, just be careful. The significance to the altar of incense. The burning of incense illustrated prayer. It illustrated prayer. And we're going to look at a few verses to deal with this. The continual burning of incense reminds us of the mandates to pray without ceasing. I thought we were going to look. I thought I had a psalm in there. Go back and look. The continual burning of incense should remind us of the mandate to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 It's a continual... Uh, it's not that you're praying all the time and you've got work to do, right? But it's you're on, in the position of prayer. You're walking in fellowship with the Lord, so you're in praying ground all the time. That's the idea. You're, it's a continual conversation going on with God. You know, you get in the car. Sometimes my wife and I, would go somewhere and we'll start off and... Maybe we hadn't had a chance to talk for a while. We just start out, we're just talking. You're down the road about a mile. <laughs> we get down the road for a while, and then it stops talking. We're not, we're not, we don't have as much to say, and all of a sudden we're reminded of something. We start talking again. I hadn't done anything to wrong yet. And so we're still in fellowship with each other, see? And so we're going along, and we're, we're still talking. It's, it's all right, it's all right. It's because if you do something wrong, the fellowship's broken, right? That's what happens with God. So you do something wrong, fellowship's broken. You've got to come, I was wrong. Fellowship back, we're talking again. That's the way it needs to be with God. We're, we're constantly on a, on a conversational status with Him. And if we violate, and by sin, we're no longer on that conversational status. We need to go and, and admit to Him our wrong, and now we can talk with Him again. See, it's a continual thing. Well, that was the continual presence of the burning of the incense. And another thing about the burning of the incense, the cloud that came from it was to cover the Ark of the Covenant to kind of form a, a shadow or a barrier so you didn't see the full glory. Hard to do that if it's not in the same room. Hard to do that if you, even if you've got a curtain in between. So that's another uh, thing to think about. Our great high priest, Jesus Christ, prays for those who are in Christ through faith alone, in Him alone. 1 John 2.1 Often uh, prayer is going to be seen as a, a fragrant aroma that comes before God. In Exodus 30, 11 through 16, we have the census. The census was needed to raise money for the operation of the tabernacle. And there's an ominous tone when that census is taken. Now, I want you to take a look at this real quick. Verse 11, The Lord also spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of them, then each of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. Hmm. We take a census, there could be a plague. Let's just not take one. What happens when David takes a census without God's uh, guidance? There's a plague. He gets to choose that, but there's a plague. God, however, sanctions this census. But when the census is taken without his sanction, uh, there's going to be problems. And he shows that I'm letting you take this census now because I'm telling you to do this. But you be careful about taking a census because often when a census is taken, what is wanting to be found out is the strength of man. Either numbers for a military event or numbers for taxes, but man wanting to gain power some way. Government wanting to take power. And so God says, you're going to take a census, but you're going to do it a certain way. If you don't do it this way, it's going to be a problem. Now in the altar of incense, here's the priest. And so I would say that the ark is over here. And others would say the ark's behind that veil. Writer Hebrews says in the tabernacle at least, the ark would be over here. But you can't find a picture of that. No one, you can't find a model like that. Uh, somebody needs to make one for us radicals. The priesthood function... Uh, here, a little slide I have. Here's a here's priesthood. And there was one thing that I didn't point out. There was no shoes. There was no priesthood Reeboks for him to, to wear. And the reason is, there was to be nothing between 
uh, God's creation and the image bearer here. He's operating in a humble position in the presence of God. What is Moses told? Burning bush, take off your shoes, you're in holy ground. What is Joshua told when the soldier shows up and it's the, it's the angel of the Lord, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, take off your shoes, you're on holy, holy ground. They were on holy ground. Another reason they had to cleanse their feet, they get blood on their feet and their hands in the sacrifices. So the priesthood, we have a function. We have an ambassadorship toward the world, ambassadors for Christ with the message of reconciliation. But also in our priesthood, we have a prayer role. We have a vertical function and a horizontal function in our priesthood. And what we see in the priest of the tabernacle and the temple, we can learn a little something about worship by studying the tabernacle and what they were to do and how they were to do it in the sense of the uh, principles of the attitude and other things. The final piece of furniture described was the bronze labor. Exodus 30, 17 through 21. Exodus 30, 17, Moses reminded the Israelites that every detail of the tabernacle came from the very word of God. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, all of this is from what God has told Moses and shown Moses. In Exodus 30, 18, the warnings were a constant visualization of cleansing or purity. Watch this. Let's just read the labor section. It's very short. Verse 18 says, You shall also make a labor of bronze with its base of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. They were not told anything of what it really looks like. But when they enter the tent of the meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. You enter into the tabernacle proper without being cleansed, you could die. Or when they approach the altar to the minister by the offering up of the smoke of fire sacrifice to the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. Twice this is brought up. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. This is like serious. You don't go in there without being cleansed. You don't serve the Lord without being in a cleansed position. You see, and that, that we can draw a lot of application with. Next is 30, 19 through 21. The failure to approach God in a cleansed position endangered the priest's life. You better take it serious. The significance of the labor of cleansing. Only the cleansed believer can approach the throne room of God and serve Him. Therefore, he must confess his sins to serve. You've got to be in a position of cleansing. That's what, when we confess our sins, we're forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. We're put back in that position of service, back in that position of worship. Now here's a couple of different drawings of the labor of cleansing. The last one we saw had uh, a bowl at the top and a basin at the bottom. This one just has a basin at the top. That'd be hard to get your feet up over into that one. Or maybe you put the water on your feet and wash them down below. And then this one is a little bit different as well. Uh, a basin at the bottom and a basin at the top. It was made again out of the bronze mirrors of the women, which I think uh, symbolizes the greatest sacrifice of all. Ooh, ooh. Look out. I usually get a reaction whenever I say that. so Because uh, ladies like their mirrors. But it was a sacrifice on behalf of everyone. Everyone who decided to bring what they uh, had. And there was a lot of things to bring. And so everyone had a little something which they could bring in order for the tabernacle to be built. The anointing oil, verses 22 to 33, also emphasized the importance of purity. The anointing oil also emphasized the importance of purity. Only the best materials were used in the tabernacle and only the best workmanship could fulfill God's plan. Just as the rainbow was the okay, just as the rainbow was the sign of God's covenant with Noah, so the Sabbath was the sign of his covenant with Israel. And there's an interesting uh, way in which things uh, end in the tabernacle section. In Exodus 31, 12, all the way through, it ends with the Sabbath. And then we get an interruption. 32, 33, 34, golden calf episode and the situations after that. Then when Moses begins to tell the people of Israel about the tabernacle, he begins with the Sabbath. 
remind them of who their God is and the laws in which He has put forth. So there's sort of a, uh, a, a just markers to show us setting these sections off. The observance of the Sabbath served as a weekly reminder of Israel's set-apart status as a nation unto God. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Profaning the Sabbath with normal daily work resulted in death. And see, that would be the thing. You would take a day off from what you normally did. And normally you don't have a lamb stray off. You had to go find it. That's Hopefully, not a normal thing. There's a lot of waste of time there. I grew up on the farm, and somebody was always calling, when your cows are out, great. But anyway, uh, you hope that's not a normal thing. You wanted to take a rest from your normal routine of life. And to go about your normal routine, try to make money, and continue with your routine, whatever it was, that was profaning the Sabbath. You were to rest in the Lord. The tablets of the law introduced here played a role in the golden calf events soon to follow. Look at the very last verse of the first tabernacle section. Verse 18. When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. These tablets of stone written by the very finger of God. And what's going to happen as soon as Moses gets to the bottom of the mountain? Pham! He's going to break them. Just as Israel is breaking the law, right? The first two commandments, they're breaking them by building an image and worshiping another God. The golden calf and its results, we we'll quickly just run through this because there's not a whole lot to fill in. We're going to, most of this is going to be the tabernacle over again. But you do have some interesting events uh, uh, before you get to that. Uh, Israel rebelled against God, 32 1 through 6. Moses has to intercede on behalf of Israel and stays off God's wrath. I mean, God's ready to get rid of them, start again with Moses. And Moses says, God, you can't do that. You've made a contract. And you have a promise. Yes, I know they're, you know they're wrong, but you can't do that. And God changes his mind. Talking about trying to figure something out. How can God change his mind? Well, we don't have time to deal with that in detail, but he had... It's the difference between God making a, uh, a statement that is irrevocable and God making an announcement that is probable. Such as, in 40 days you'll be destroyed, talking to Nineveh. This was the message Jonah told, or God told Jonah to give to Nineveh and he gave it. In 40 days what happened? They weren't destroyed. Why? Because they turned to God. And God, in that sign of humility, gave them grace. Jonah didn't like it at all. We'll talk about that later, but that's what happened. So God's making an announcement here. He's not making an absolute decree. When He makes an absolute decree, there's no changing. But here He makes an announcement, this is what I'm going to do, and, God, and Moses says no, and God says, you're right. But there's going to be some punishment. Anyway, God punished the sin of idolatry. I love it when He goes down there. Moses gets down there, and Joshua says, here's the sound of war. no. Moses says that's not what it is. Gets down there and he tears up that idol, grounds it into dust, pours it in the water, makes them all drink it. You want some idolatry? Here you go. What's going to happen to that? It's going to come out the other side. This is what God thinks of idolatry. He has no respect for it whatsoever. And he, he shows it in very interesting and very degrading ways, as we saw with uh, Rachel sitting on her father's God. That's a terrible thing when that happens. God is showing this is just futility to worship something besides me. Moses interceded again and God punished again. The tent of meeting was set up outside the camp. This is a different tent of meeting than the tabernacle. This was a temporary tent of meeting where God would meet with Moses, or Moses would meet with God rather. People would have to come out there if they wanted to uh, talk with Moses. So it's a different tent of meeting. And then uh, Moses uh, interceded and God responded. He got to see uh, the glory of God, the hind parts of the glory of God at least. Moses wrote down the law. We get a repeat of the law. We need new tablets because the others are broken. 
And Israel constructed the tabernacle, and God dwelt among his people. And it's an interesting thing that happens when he comes and dwells among his people. He comes down, finally he's there, and it's been for him to dwell among them so they can come to him. And then we start in Leviticus, it's keep away until I tell you the right way to come to me. That's what Leviticus is all about, how to approach God. Now real quick, here's a drawing of the tabernacle. Note on the west side is where the ark is. East is going this way, away from God. So you start with God and you go east, away from God. It's an interesting uh, diagram in the sense that it sort of illustrates a little bit of what it was like in Eden, where God dwelt. As they went away, they went further away from God as they went east. And this seems to be a, a certain pattern in scriptures we'll see. We'll see an example of that in Ezekiel a little bit later. All right, this is a good, good breaking point. Where time we want to come back? All right, 410? Okay, let's say 410. Maybe we make it 415. <laughs>